In this conference, I will talk about clinical stages in schizophrenia and a little bit on bipolar disorder. The idea was to describe the clinical validity of clinical stages and to challenge the methodological issues and the weakness of this model, but also to uh, highlight the interest and the way of using it in clinical practice. Donc je suis ravi d'être ici pour cette conférence de l'école d'automne sur les stades évolutifs de la schizophrénie et du trouble bipolaire. Je vais donc parler et je vais donc avoir comme discutant le professeur Fusar Paoli qui vient de, du Kix Collège et de l'université de Pavie, professeur de psychiatrie de la santé mentale du sujet jeune. So I will try to discuss today the clinical approaches of staging concepts and then I will it was supposed to be around schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. You will see I will talk more or less only about schizophrenia. I have only one slide about bipolar disorder. And, uh, and, but uh, there's reasons for this and I will explain those reasons. So I will begin by the concept of staging in psychiatry. So I, I will try to discuss the clinical validity of this concept in uh, schizophrenia showing a few models and the work that was conducted by the, uh, all the teams of the foundation and a special tribute to Ophelia Godin and, uh, and Guillaume Fon. And then I will see the prediction and interest and I will uh, then give uh, the possibility and the microphone to Professor Pauli to discuss and to give his advice on uh, staging. He has worked a lot on this uh, staging uh, concept more specifically on for the ultra risk patient and at the early phase of the illness but you have published uh, different uh, works on this and i think it would be of uh, it will be really of interest to have uh, his perspectives so first of all really quickly because we try to have time to discussion and then to question uh, for questions and uh, we will uh, just uh, I will just present you a different aspect of this uh, concept so this one yes uh, so first of all the historical aspects you know that this concept has been used in a lot of different uh, medical fields like cardiology and oncology and in, in psychiatry the first publication by Fava and Kellner uh, more than 25 years ago and uh, you can see that the idea of those uh, authors was about the to include the longitudinal aspects more than the cross-sectional aspects for the clinical evaluation, but also to take into account functional consequences and comorbid symptoms. So you can see that the, it was the first proposition about uh, of the stages of schizophrenia and primary unipolar depression. You can see that prodromal acute episode, residual, subchronic, chronic. It's not so sophisticated, but try to, dis to describe the different stages of this evolution of the illness. And it's in interesting to have in mind that the idea of a progression of the illness is part of the concept of staging. And you can see that the idea was to locate the patient along this continuum of uh, the illness. And more specifically, you can see put a patient in acute episode in the residual, and that was the idea. So, the clinical stage uh, is defined that in medicine, for example, in uh, tumor, uh, uh, breast cancer, for example, degree of extent, degree of progression, biological impact, and that can be correlated to prognosis. And in psychiatry, the idea was to use other different variables in the biopsychosocial perspective, and that's why the to consider social variables and the, what, uh, what can be about functioning is an important point. So the staging model is based on the idea of a progression of the illness. And that's why it has to be discussed and used for disease in which you have this idea of progression and uh, an illness that can progress or even may progress in the future. And the interest is just to describe and to uh, focus on this transition phase, just to avoid, for example, to go from one stage to another stage that, that can be associated with the uh, impairment of functioning uh, skills, for example. And that you know all probably this uh, 
stages, staging model that was proposed for psychotic and severe mood disorder, both by Jan Scott and also Marion Le Boyer, who is not with uh, us, but she's thinking of us, I'm sure. And, uh, and you can see that you have the different stages and the interest that uh, the stages are defined by the idea of the progression of the illness and the extension of the illness using these clinical variables, symptoms, the cognitive variable, or the level of cognitive deficit that can be observed, and also the functioning, the social impairment that can be evaluated using the GAF. And another interest of the staging model the, that was proposed by McGorry, one of the the one who has promoted uh, for years the, uh, the staging model uh, is around the fact that when you look at the evolution and the different stages that can, in prospective cohort, describe the evolution and that can be of interest in order to try to understand probably that at the beginning is difficult to uh, show and to understand what is going on because you have a lot of different symptoms that can be mixed, I may say, and with the evolution you observe the different disorders that can be individuated. So, the staging model is based on a few assumptions and you can see that the main assumptions are that when you are at the early phase, you have a better response and a better prognosis. That when you use a treatment at the early phase, you have a, ben a better benefit ratio. And that we can observe the impact of the treatment by the modification of the symptoms when we are providing the treatment, but also in the evolution of the disease uh, uh, stages over time. And I think it's important just also to try to define for each stage what is the treatment and what can be the modification in terms of progression. One more time, we, we have the idea that the uh, uh, disease is progressing. Uh, the, what can be the uh, changes that can be observed? So we need also to use this to develop a physiopathological understanding of the illness and the modeling of this, and that can be of interest. One more time, we need progression of the illness, the idea that to respond better to treatment, you have to give treatment at the beginning. Probably we need to have the idea that all the, uh, the uh, diseases are progressing and we need to explore trans uh, transition phase. When we look at what was done in uh, oncology, for example, and we can, I'm, I'm quoting this by this paper by Berg uh, two years ago, just to try to show what the, the idea around uh, cancer. And you can see that the interest is to define the clinical stages, but also to have this external validation through biomarkers. And then we describe what can be the different steps, the documentation of the progression of the illness and from the genetic and environmental vulnerability to the malignant lesion and the extension of the lesions, you can see, and also the predictive validity delineated by linking the different stage with the progression of the illness and the outcome of treatments. So I think it's important just to show this in order to what we are uh, trying to reach as an objective in mental illnesses and in more specifically in schizophrenia then just in order to understand what is the goal. And it's not so easy because one more time and we all know this uh, there that biomarkers for external validation are not so easy to find. So, I will now quote uh, our guest, and I think it's important to, uh, I have uh, I've used this article, it's a very interesting article that is a review about the uh, different treatment and the way of improving the outcome of first episode psychosis. And in this article, Professor Fusapoli uh, may also the uh, parallel with the cancer and oh, it's interesting that he said that we need more robust evidence to support the clinical utility of these stages proposed, for example three and four and I will go back to all those stages and that's part of the work that we have conducted with the, in uh, the cohort, uh, the schizophrenia cohort of the foundation. So,
we have also a lot of uh, methodological interrogation, and I will go more deeper in, uh, deeper in this uh, later on. And but. Uh, the idea that one canvas can be used for the progression of each disorder, which is very not so easy to understand, but also to demonstrate. The way of distinguishing the early phases at risk or what can be only manifestation of transient dis distress, for example. What are the lines, and it's a huge debate between prodromes and pathological states, and how to treat comorbidities, and what is the notion of transition. So now I will go to example of modeling uh, clin uh, the clinical staging in schizophrenia and with recent papers that were published uh, during the last two years and just to show you that there are different ways of approaching this with different results. First of all, the first model. It was published two years ago and it's um, you know, a retrospective study with a large sample from a genetic study that was conducted in, um, in Holland. And uh, you, they tried to explore the validity of the model, the stability over time, and also the clinical factors associated with transition. And they use, in this case, they predefine what are the clinical stages according to one definition by McGorry. And you can see the definition, the different stage and the definition. And you can see that when you look at this, it's very small, sorry about this, but oh. uh, you have the episodes, the level of symptoms, and also the impairment of functioning using the GAFT, definition of functioning. And they, so they define those stages, use this uh, scale, these definitions, and try to classify the population, first of all, uh, at, at baseline, because it's a retrospective study, but they have long, longitudinal data, as I will show this later. So when you look at this, the one, uh, one first point, you have seen that there's more than 1,000 patients, only close to 650 patients were was affected to a stage. So it was not so easy using these definitions to put, to affect a patient to a stage and to use the clinical picture of the patient and to say he's in stage two, three, four, or whatever. And you can see the, the it's difficult one more time to read, but you, when you look at this, it's uh, obvious that those are the the variables that are used to define the stage. It's so it's uh, obvious that they will, uh, we will have a difference between the different stages. And you can see that probably we have a, an impairment in premorbid functioning for people that were observed at the higher stage, probably related to the higher level of progression of the illness, if you, we, we use this definition. And there's a few differences, but it's not so... Obvious because you have, you know, for example, the uh, onset of illness and you have the, the, um, the mean age and you can see that there's differences, but it's not very coherent when you look at it. That's the first model. So very, not simple, but you look at this and you use the definition and you try to affect the patient to a stage and it's difficult. And the difference, it's difficult to, to use. A second one was published a few weeks ago, uh, September, I guess, and they, it's uh, only a cross-sessional study with a, a very important uh, sample, more than 2,000 patients, 2,358, and with the diagnosis of schizophrenia in different, uh, all over the world, in different countries, even in France, and you can see that the patient with the mean age of 37, but also there's a a few, uh, not so few, uh, one quarter of the patient were in the first episode, but it's interesting to see that 34 of them were in the first episode, chronic patient whose first episode never resulted for the duration of more than five, five years. So you can see that very specific patients are included in this sample, but it's of interest. And they have used a very different approach to uh, affect a patient to a stage and to define the stages. I will not go into detail because I will not be able to, but it will be too long if I will try. The way they have identified the different stages, but it's of interest to see that they have, on one hand, used the illness duration, and on the other hand, they have all uh, used the factor scores. They have 
developed a factor analysis just in order to identify specific score uh, factors sorry uh, of symptoms in the using the pants and they try to see what can be and it's more at the beginning an optic way of identifying what are the modification you know and when you have a modification of the curve and they define the stages and the uh, and the sub stages and you can see that when you look at positive symptoms is this so at the beginning a lot of positive symptoms disc uh, discrepancies then it increase and then it decrease and it increase when you look at the neurocognitive impairment you have a an increasing of the neurocognitive impairment. When you look at depressive symptoms, it's an increase. So they use this in order to say, for each stages, you have one factor that can be considered as predominant for all the patients. And it's of interest because, you know, it's not so easy to use it, but because using this criteria, they, they only classify 55% of the patients. But what is of interest is they define those stages using a predominant psychopathology. You can see this. What is interesting is the fact that uh, negative symptoms are not considered as a, not important, but uh, something that can define a specific stage. And you can see that when you look at negative symptoms, it's this um, up. And uh, it's a bit surprising, but it's interesting because they built some kind of path, uh, psychopathological description of the illness that I think is interesting. We can discuss about this, but it's interesting. Then I will go to this sample that you know, a lot of you know it, and this publication by Ophelia Godin, and uh, I think it's, you, you know, all about those patients, you know all, all about the cohort, and I will not go into details. But what the main difference compared to the two of the models is the way uh, the stages were the, identified. It's uh, an algorithm, non-supervised, and it's interesting because it's only it's only meaning that only the data and the three kind of variables, so to Pan's total score, the number of recurrence or relapse and the global functioning, that will differentiate patients and, and group, help us to group patients in different clusters. And you can see that it's relevant that in terms of progression, you have an increase of the severity and the level of Pan's score and a decrease in functioning from one stage to another stage. What is of interest is the fact that the number of episodes has not a lot of uh, impact on differentiating the, uh, it's uh, coherent with the different stages, but it's not uh, the same impact compared to the um, intensity of symptoms, the pan's total score, and the level of functioning. And when you look, it's difficult to read, so don't worry about this, but the main interest is the, that it's interesting to see that we have an increase and related with a very significant uh, progression in terms of depressive and, negative and uh, manic symptoms. One more time, this timic symptomatology seems to be of interest in those patients, and I think we have, find, we have found in, uh, in the uh, schizophrenia cohort a lot of uh, uh, importance of depressive symptoms, and that's rather coherent with, with, with what was proposed by uh, Funtulakis. And when you look at other aspects uh, that may be may, may differ significantly differ from one stage to another stage, you have also difference in terms of treatment. And it's of interest to see, for example, when you look at clozapine, there's no difference from one stage to another stage that is not coherent. And it's probably more related to the way clozapine is used by clinicians and not to the uh, severity of the illness, but probably that's part of what can be some, um, introduce some difficulty of understanding and to difficulty or describe all these clinical stages. So another point, I will not go into details, but just to see that uh, when you use all those cognitive variables, you have a significant differences between all the different stages. And uh, one more time, uh, people are more impaired at the, uh, for the uh, upper grades. So the higher uh, level of uh, intensity of the illness, we may say, and it's uh, really significant. So we have two clinical models 
the one and the three that are rather uh, congruent in terms of conceptualization, symptoms, functioning, episodes, and that helps to discriminate. The model two is really different, and I think it's rather innovative, but we can discuss about methodology and probably the way of generalizing it, and I think it's of interest, but I have a lot of different flows that can be underlined. So, just to challenge the Model 2, uh, Ophelia performed for me this. It's not the same way, but when you look at the symptoms, you remember th this, just go this, the different factors, the different aspects with the evolution, and we look just in our sample, looking at the different factors, positive, negative, cognitive, excitement, depression, uh, symptoms, you have only an, an, an increase of the level of symptoms, and you have the, it's a variation in terms of, you, it's the same way, it's in terms of duration of illness, and it's not the same evolution when you compare uh, from, uh, in our sample. So, what are the prospective interests of the staging model? When we look at the model one, uh, the, on the um, Dutch sample, you can see that 44% uh, stay at the same stage, but you can see that more than half of the patients change from one stage to another stage. And probably most of the people, most of the patients, are more have a more a higher probability to have a transition from this incomplete remission of from first psychosis to minimal complaint, but there's also the transition from severe to minimal complaints, and it's uh, not so frequent, but it's 22 percent of this sample. When we look at our, our sample that was in the publication by Ophelia, and you can see that we have patients going from one stage to another stage. It means that after one year, some are st staying stable, some are um, improving those, and some are, have an increase of the symptomatology and the uh, decrease of the level of functioning. And when we, go, uh, we look at more recently with the larger sample that was not published, you can see the same trends and the differences. And when you look, we try to differentiate, it's not published this, but when you look at the sample, it's interesting to see that we are not able to identify uh, real interesting uh, characteristics that are associated one more time, according to the sample, we have, uh, it's not a lot of patients. You can see the size of the different uh, uh, part of the sample, subsamples. And you can see that, I put it in bold, but it's not very interesting what that this means. For example, mood stabilizer, negative symptoms, but it's not so, I, I don't think it's really of interest and it doesn't help to interpret this, but it, we have to try to observe this. And when you look at the patient from, uh, it's a grade, f not five, it's four, and you, is, there's no real difference between the patient improving or, or staying at the same uh, level of uh, the illness. So another point is, how can we predict? We have tried to evaluating the, uh, the uh, progression, what can be the prognosis, but how can we predict something? And you can see that in this, um, the one more time, the model one, they have made using a logistic regression something that may help a progression to, to define a, more, a progression to more chronic stages. And hostility was probably the, the factor making the contribution, but the variance is very low when you look at the total of the variance. And it's a lower quality of life, higher level of hostility, higher level of depression that can be associated with the prognosis of evolution with a more chronic stage of uh, follow-up. In the sample from face uh, schizo, uh, is a paper by the famous Guillaume Fon, um, you can see that in this machine learning approach, I will not define this, I will not be able to, but it was interesting to try to define what can be the predictors of psychotic relapse. And you can see, according to this, using this uh, scale to evaluate the level of uh, uh, aggressiveness, 
And you can see that we obtain uh, a level of uh, sense prediction of 63.8% with a sensitivity of 71, which is not so bad, and specificity, which is not so good, of 44.8. So it's of interest to see that we can try, but can we use this in clinical practice? That has to be asked. And just to end this, um, the trajectory approach this was published by a Chinese colleague uh, last year, and it was in a first episode patient in a specialized inter 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 intervention program. And you can see that they have evaluated the, them for three years. And they try to evaluate, so there's case management, psychological support, job coaching, and they have identified using a, a, a specific analysis, they have identified different trajectories, and you can see that they are rather different. They are not parallel, they are rather different, and I think it's of interest to try to know what is going on there when you see, because for example, in terms of baseline, it's a level of functioning at baseline, then you can see that they are close, those two groups of trajectories, and that's the same for them, but the evolution is rather different. So it would be of interest to identify one more time to predict, to try to predict what, is, what are the differences and what are the differences in terms of uh, a treatment or, or whatever. In our sample, that is not published yet, but uh, it's part of the work by uh, Ophelia, we try to make this analysis and trajectory approach using the combining of PANS and GAF, so symptoms and functioning. And we have identified three different trajectories. What is rather interesting is the fact that they are rather parallel. And you can see then when you have a high level of pants, you stay with a high level of pants. And when you have a high level of GAF, it's the same. And when you look at the different uh, patients from the, with those different trajectories, I think they more or less stay in the same level of symptoms and combining symptoms and, uh, and uh, functioning. And it's one more time a question. It's not easy to interpret. But I think at the end, probably, it's interesting to try to know what is going on with those patients, what is the difference, and is everything done at the beginning, or what can be done to modify things, and for example, to have this improving there. So at the end, What's next? We need biomarkers. That's uh, something that has been said a lot of time, but we don't have it yet. Do we need new statistical tools? Do you need, we need new methodologies? That has to be asked. We have seen that a lot of different methodologies were used to try to validate the clinical staging model. But, uh, and uh, what is the interest of our cohorts? We can see that we need a huge cohort, and probably we, there's a lot of different things, but in observational cohort, it's very difficult to identify all the variables that has to probably are, are involved in the modification of a trajectory for one patient. So I think it's something that has to be discussed. And can we use this staging model in clinical practice? So the next frontier, probably for Marion, but Marion is not there, that's us for her, a precision staging. I think it's uh, probably a dream for Marion Le Boyer. And you can see that um, this is of interest to see you have the different stages, and then we will find different possibility of treating patients with characteristic genomics, epigenomics, of the omics that you can use just to, in order to identify in each stage of the illness the um, possibility to have this kind of precision treatment. That's probably a possibility, not, but not yet. Just for bipolar disorder, just to show you very quickly two different models that, uh, of staging that was proposed by Berk and Kapzinski. And you can see that when you look at the uh, different models, they are rather different. In, in uh, schizophrenia, the models are rather mm, more or less with symptoms, uh, functioning, and, um, and cognitive impairment. But in this, you have the, the risk at the beginning and the non-specific symptoms, but then after you have the, the episode, the rec uh, recurrence, and the relapse, and multiple relapses. And it's more, it's closer to the stages that was described just at the beginning, remember, by Fava Kellner. 
When you look at Kaczynski, they use different things with the symptoms during the inter-episodic episode, the, the impairment in cognition and functioning. So it's closer to what was observed uh, in the, what we observed in schizophrenia around symptoms and impairments. But one more time, for example, the symptoms during inter-episodic episode is an important thing, but probably related to the specificity of the evolution of bipolar disorder. And it was only to, to show you this paper that was published a few months ago by uh, Mark. There's two, paper, two different papers, but I will show only this one. And they use the two models, A and B. The name, uh, they use the two models. And they, you know, it was not so easy to stage the patients uh, with model A and model B, not for all the patients. And it's interesting to see that the level of association between the two models was not so good. And it's interesting to see it's really in, in conceptualized uh, in a different way, I guess, but also probably in the clinical practice, in, uh, in the l rather large sample, you can observe that when you took they propose to combine the two models just to try to differenti uh, differentiate the patient and you use both. So I guess that's why I haven't shown data about uh, staging in bipolar disorder in the co bipolar cohort that we have got because I think we need to think more about it and what can be the possibility to define and to try to validate the clinical uh, stages. So. Just to end my talk, the paper by Professor Pauli about the science of prognosis in psychiatry. And I think it's a very interesting paper, a very recent paper. And you can, I will not read it. You can read it about the fact that the importance of prognosis in psychiatry and the importance of improving the, the way of clinician may have a, uh, the, they will take into account the psychosis and to uh, increase their level of knowledge in terms of uh, the way of doing some prognosis. I, I will not go into detail because I don't have any time and Professor Pauli, uh, Professor Pauli is there so he can talk about this. And just at the end, before giving the microphone, one of these last papers about this transdiagnostic psychiatry. Because we have discussed about different disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar, and there's some kind of new, one more time, a new frontier, what about transdiagnostic? And I recommend the lecture of this article because uh, Professor Pauli and, and uh, Fusa Pauli will probably explain better than me, but this transdiagnostic approach is yet very difficult uh, to um, take into account and the evidences are really weak and we need to work more about this and at the time we are trying to discuss and to work more uh, combining the data from different networks in our foundation and I think it's a good approach but probably we need to try to improve the conceptualization of this strong di diagnostic approach in order to produce a good level of evidence with the real methodologic uh, rigor that can, will help for the future works. So thank you for your attention and I give the microphone to Professor Fusarpoli. My name is uh, Paolo Fusarpoli, I'm professor of psychiatry and youth mental health at King's College London and uh, University of Pavia and my clinical uh, research and academic interests focus on uh, early psychosis, on how to improve detection, prognosis and treatment for young people with emerging severe mental disorders and I've been honored today to participate in this symposium to discuss the clinical validity and the challenges of implementing clinical staging in psychiatry. Good afternoon. Um, very honored to be here and to participate in this uh, symposium. Thank you very much for inviting me and for having me here. And uh, congratulations on, on uh, your um, outstanding presentation. I think we all agree that clinical staging uh, nowadays is, is trendy, is popular, is something we need. I think we, everyone would agree that currently the way we diagnose patients is not satisfactory. Um, I think the problem is then what's the alternative? Do we really have an alternative to be using in clinical routine and what's the evidence for that? And this is what I think you have tried to uh, cover with your excellent presentations and, and, and studies. Um, 
I think before um, I would like to, to flash some some criticalities for for this field, maybe to ask you also some questions, and maybe if you want also also to intervene. But before we start, I think we need to remember that there are core um, epistemological issues when we try to appraise the clinical validity of clinical staging in psychiatry. I don't know whether you know, but for example, clinical staging um, for brain disorder or brain cancer is somehow different as compared to clinical staging in other, in other parts of the body. And this is also um, telling us something, I think, this uh, somehow is quite surprising. It's telling us that when we need to investigate uh, a difficult organ to access, like the brain, we do have empirical and epistemological problems and challenges. So you said we would like to have biomarkers, but we do not have. So that's already a big difference as compared to um, organic medicine, where clinical staging is corroborated by anatomopathological findings, etiopathological results, and, and so forth. Therefore, we basically are stuck with f functioning symptoms and describing epiphenomena um, of, of something which is uh, happening in the underlying brain, which we don't really um, understand. Having said that, it's clear um, um, a great potential to try to implement clinical staging in medicine. And on an empirical level, it has allowed uh, one of the first preventive intervention in psychiatry, in the history of psychiatry, because the clinical staging, we have heard that it can be applied to different mental disorders, but it has mostly been developed for psychotic disorders, and in particular for the very early phases of psychosis. And that's through the um, clinical staging model that currently we can detect patients, young adolescents and, and children, who are at risk of, the, of developing um, psychosis, who are not yet ill. And then we can intervene and potentially we can also prevent the onset of psychosis. And it's also thanks to the uh, clinical staging model that we can detect patients with the first episode of psychosis and trying to intervene earlier and to improve their outcomes. So, uh, great potentials, uh, worthwhile, uh, but at the, same, at the same time there are challenges, there are um, uh, issues that need to be addressed. And actually, I think I would like to ask you, what do you think about uh, some of these challenges? So, um, looking at your slides, one of your slides was showing that patients were moving across stages. And my question is, is it really possible for patients to shift across stages. So in organic medicine, once, for example, you are diagnosed with stage one cancer, even then if your response to treatment will change in the future, you will retain your initial stage. So is it possible for clinical sta stages to change? And associated to this, is it possible to um, jump stages, for example, to go from stage one to stage three, which is again a bit um, not that frequent in organic medicine, or even more problematic to go back from um, stage three cancer to stage one cancer? I think it's an important question because one more time, clinical stages rely on, in, in uh, psychiatry, rely on symptoms, functioning, and even cognitive measurements. And we have treatments who, uh, who have a real efficacy in terms of symptoms. So we, we are able to improve symptoms, not all the symptoms, but in, when we are improving symptoms, when we are improving using drugs for the symptoms, but also all the psychosocial intervention that we, can, we are able to develop, we are improving functioning. So we are improving at least two of the variables. So, when we describe the clinical model, we are improving, jumping from one stage to another stage. But when we try to think what does this mean, when we compare to cancer, moving from this level of progression of the illness from another level of progression, that can be related, for example, for the brain functioning more specifically, probably not. We are compensating from an it's not a modification of the quality of the illness. It's more uh, a 
quantitative modification, and it's not a real modification from one stage for, for, to the other stage, but it's really related to the limit of our clinical staging and the fact that we don't have biomarkers. So, completely agree, we can move, when we look at the clusters we describe, for example, but the others in the other model too. But at the end of the day, when we think about the illness, probably not. Okay, thank you. Uh, and my next challenge would um, relate to the multidimensional nature of, of clinical staging in organic medicine. So if you think at, at the TNM model, it includes uh, a multidimensional approach. And in your presentation, you mostly focused on symptoms. I think you touched a bit on, on functioning. Maybe that could be a second dimension. And what's, what's in your view, what are the dimensions that more likely will, will help you with your models to improve accuracy for, for staging? You mentioned something about biomarkers, but on which one would you like to focus? Or have you got any, any thought about that? We, we were thinking about focusing on, for example, inflammatory markers, we have used CRP, we didn't demonstrate any modification, but there's a very recent paper a few days ago about the fact that there's a parallel between neuroprogression and somatoprogression and trying to show that you may have um, this parallel between, for example, an increase of the level of uh, inflammation in patients associated with the, for example, the level of uh, metabolic syndrome that from one stage to another stage, and that can be related, so kind of uh, evaluation by proxy, but it's not really true, but for part of the patient, to, uh, that can be related to this neuroprogression. So probably focusing on these markers, trying to find probably more specific inflammatory markers, for, for example, try to uh, make a correlation with uh, uh, another kind of uh, va clinical variable like uh, the weight or the, the BMI and things like that, probably that can be part of one something that we may try to do. So combining inflammatory marker and uh, clinical variables more on the uh, somatic state of the patient and probably metabolic syndrome, that can be something that may help. I have asked Ophelia to do so, but she was taking care of her kids and she did not want to do it for the presentation. So I was a bit upset, but uh, one more time, kids. Thank you. Um, a relatively easy question, at least for me. Your clinical staging models, they focus on, if I got it correct, DSM-4 or 5 schizophrenia. Yeah. Right. So. That's a, it's assuming that DSM-4 and 5 schizophrenia is, is valid as a diagnosis. Uh, wh why not psychosis, at least? It's a, it's a good question. <laughs> so uh, I don't have any answer about this, but we will have, uh, uh, unfortunately, we have to, you have to leave to go back to London, but we will have an epistemological uh, conference this afternoon around symptoms and illness and tomorrow too, and I think that will give some kind of thinking about the way of using the diagnostic criteria. Yeah, I was asking because, for example, where I work in South London, we do have early intervention services and they are not for schizophrenia, they are for psychosis. And so we use psychosis as a broad umbrella. And, and that's what we see, in particular, at, at the time of the first onset. I mean, it's, it's somehow it's very difficult to differentiate between first episode um, schizophrenia-like psychotic disorders and or affective psychotic disorders, at least to my experience. And uh, I think this is also bringing us to uh, how much we should open the door to other disorders. So you mentioned this uh, other trendy word, which is transdiagnostic, yeah. right? Um, it's, uh, I don't know whether you have heard transdiagnostic. This again has been, become very popular. And uh, I found kind of uh, it repeated on several articles and then papers, newspapers, conferences, symposia. Until some, someday I wonder actually what's the, the meaning of transdiagnostic and nobody knew and, and so, okay, I said I will try to look into that and I discovered that it's, uh, it's really a um, quite confusing term as at, at least as it is uh, being used currently. It, uh, it has to do with the limits of current diagnosis but again it has at the moment not very much evidence based 
to be offered as alternatives. For example, I, I performed this systematic review of the literature which was um, collecting all articles using the word transdiagnostic in their titles. So there were articles self-proclaiming to be transdiagnostic. And then, bizarrely, in some of them, uh, basically the researchers, they did not bother at all to formulate any diagnosis. And then they acknowledged the problem, saying, uh, well, actually, yes, it would have been important to diagnose our patients, but we have not done that. And so it has been somehow used in a very loose manner, and when we look at what's the real world alternative to current DSM-4, 5, ICD-10, 11 diagnosis, there's still uh, nothing to be, to be used in clinical routine. This is not to be skeptical, but sometimes I think we need to keep our feet on the ground and at least to use the scientific research in a coherent manner. So between schizophrenia and transdiagnostic psychiatry, maybe there is something in the middle. Maybe just uh, focusing on psychosis may be um, interesting enough, maybe opening comparative studies to severe mental disorders like bipolar or depression may be interesting. And to this point, I think the question may be, for example, if you want to validate clinical staging model for psychosis compared to bipolar and depression, you said that, for example, with respect to bipolar, there are similarities with, with, uh, with psychosis. Do you think there is a universal clinical staging model for serious mental disorders? It's a kind of philosophical question again, sorry to ask you <laughs> philosophical questions, but it's, it's another a kind of a trendy word, universal intervention in psychiatry, transdiagnostic psychiatry. Do you think we will achieve eventually a universal clinical staging model for severe mental disorders like psychosis, bipolar and depression? or? how many clinical staging models would we eventually need? I don't think it's a philosophical question, I guess. But I don't think there's an universal model because I think we have seen that, uh, for example, it's interesting when I sh I've shown the two models between uh, um, the, um, in bipolar disorder, you can, we may understand this. And I think it's of just of interest to see that it will not be relevant to add this universal because if we go to universal we will keep only episodes intensity of symptoms and not all the symptoms and that's it and i think it would be very difficult so i think it's not relevant but on the other hand how many models must we have and um, is it relevant to have models for each disease and the concept of disease in psychiatry is not so so stable, I guess. So I think uh, probably more than uh, we, we have probably to try. But one more time, it's uh, you know this uh, this kind of word that has been largely used, a dimensional, using more dimensional aspect to build the staging model. And I think, but one more time, what which dimension to choose? And probably that can be really a challenge just to identify what kind of dimension we need, specific dimension, and then use it. Uh, to build the staging models with other variables or not, I don't know, but probably that will be helpful and to help to have a limited number of models and of staging and probably that will be the, the idea. I've shown this slide just to show you that in this study the, it was interesting to see that you have the um, it was a patient from the uh, genetic uh, stu study and it was psychosis the, the, and what made the difference between the, uh, you have a difference in terms of, psy from psychosis to schizophrenia and for the, sta the higher stage, schizophrenia is more represented than uh, psychosis, a schizophrenic form, it's not psychosis. But so, it's, so it's interesting to see that it's uh, highlight what you were saying and confirm what we are saying, probably schizophrenia, but one way of explaining it in our sample, we have more, probably more chronic patient and it's more schizophrenia remains relevant, I guess, but I completely agree about the, uh, the, the fact of using more psychosis as a disease than more than schizophrenia. So, you have a question? You have a question? If not, I need to ask another harsh question. <laughs> Okay, we go for the last question. So um, the other question would be, 
I think there is some difference between clinical staging, which is based on uh, on symptoms functioning and in medicine organ uh, anatomopathological findings, and stratification, which is based on risks and prognosis. And it seems that most of your research is validating a clinical staging model as opposed to a risk stratification model. So possibly when we start looking at how these clinical stages are predicting outcomes, response to treatment, uh, the picture is even more problematic and blurred across, for example, clinical stages three and four. If we look at stratification, so for example, risks and prognosis between stage one and two, which is um, prodromal psychosis and first episode of psychosis, the two stages um, differentiate quite well. But for, for the more advanced stages, then um, when, when we talk about prognosis and clinical stratification is, is even a bit more uh, difficult. So do you want to, maybe to comment on this? Yeah, I think one of the important points is probably that we have more, more intervention, more treatment, more, a lot of different variables that, we, that can be very different from when, for example, you are working on a large cohort with patients from different areas. You have a lot of differences in, in terms of the way the patients are treated, uh, uh, all the different uh, treatment that we use, and probably that has really an influence on prognosis. One more time, it doesn't modify from one stage to another stage, but probably it's had an influence in terms of the probability of uh, modification, and we don't control those variables. So probably, even if we have big cohorts, it's creating a noise that we don't control, and it, it's blurring the, the, the results. So it's, that's part of one of the difficulties that we are with this. We want to have larger samples, but the larger sample is with the risk of noise is important and it's difficult to take, uh, to draw a real conclusion about this. So probably that, and more specifically, you know, in these intermediate stages. That, uh, so I think it's really, um, we need to think in terms of methodology and the way of, uh, I'm very aware about the size of a cohort, what is relevant, is, is more specific to have, a, for example, on an intervention co cohort with a, a smaller size of the sample with a better control on different variables compared to a very observational generalized one, you, you may not obtain the same kind of results. And, for different reasons, for more organizational reason or funding reason, nothing like that, we don't think of this when we are trying to build the project. And I think it's part of the of the weakness that we've got when we try to develop this kind of project. But uh, that another another level of uh, of thinking of it, and I think it's but it's important because when we are building project, we we try to find funding, and uh, we have these kind of difficulties.